raise your hands. No, there's no shame. Good. Look at this term. I want W0. And I have that the only non-zero co uh, component of P is the is the P0. So already the only thing that is different from zero here is when nu equal to zero. So if nu equal to zero, we have nu equal to zero here, so nu cannot be zero. Because if nu is zero, you have a it's an antisymmetric object, so it cannot be equal. So that means that W0 is zero. W0 is zero. And then W i is essentially um, If you look at this, w, you put i, 0, j, k, you have p0, which is m, and then m, j, k. And that is essentially the definition of the angular momentum. So it's actually w, i, if you place, play with the signs because of the epsilon symbol, you can back, you can back with that the that, that the poly Lubinsky vector is essentially the zero component is zero, but the special components are just proportional to the angular momentum. So then, now you, we have an interpretation of what this label is. This label will be essentially the, the J of the rotation group. Okay, because you, it will be just proportional to, to the, J, the, the J square here. Okay, so in this case, we have we have that the multiplet can can be labeled as the mass, and instead of uh, the W now we know that it's just the angular momentum. Those are the two Casimirs, and then to the differentiate the states within the multiplet, we have the p mu's and the j3. Okay. So this is a, a, a way to define a massive elementary particle. And uh, actually, this is a, you can use this as a definition of a particle. So what is a particle? It's a irreducible representation of the Lorentz group, or the Poincare group, I'm sorry. And that means that we have, it's characterized by the, some quantum numbers, so there's the mass, spin, the momentum, and the third component of the spin. So that's a way of describing a particle. So essentially, in a world, we are all made out of representations of the Poincare group. So that's nice. So now you know, you know what you are now. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Okay, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's the case of the massive particles. For the massless, for the massless, we discuss, sorry, we discuss massive. And for the massless, it's a bit more complicated because uh, you have now the momentum, which is to be like that, because you have to have p mu, p mu equal to zero. So you can have the zero and one of the special components to be equal, and they cancel then in, in the p mu, p mu, because of the signature of the, of the metric. And uh, uh, so those are the p mu's. But then you will say, uh, following naively what we did for the massive case, for the massive case, we say, oh, we look, the little group will be the thing that live invariant the, the the special components of the of the of the of the p mu. In this case, it will be anything that rotates these two. In principle, that will be the the, the the little group. However, when you try to do it, it's, it's not only that. It's not that simple. So the little group is much more complicated. Um, <coughs> and uh, I will write for you the components of the of the. Um, of the Pauli Lubansky vector. Uh, 
And the, the The interesting thing is that that uh, this W1, W2, and W3 leave uh, generate an algebra is a uh, is the Euclidean group in two dimensions. This is five W1, W2 equal to zero. W3, W1 equals to I, W2. And W3, W2 equals minus I, W1. And, uh, <coughs> and in general, this, this, this algebra, which is a Euclidean group in two dimensions, that will give you the little group for the massless case. It includes the rotations in two dimensions the, as a subgroup, but it has is much bigger than that. And for the, pro, the <coughs> problem with this one is that it has infinite dimensional representations. So you will have infinite dimensional representations. You can have an, an extra label uh, similar to P's the, to label the, the, the massless particles, and there will be a continuum, uh, continuous label. And we don't know any particle that has an extra continuous label. So the way to fix that problem is to say, well, let's concentrate only on the subgroup of this group that has finite dimensional representations, and that is the SO2 group. choose W W one and W two equal to zero. Okay. So I, I, I emphasize this the reason is that I personally I'm not very happy with this argument. So it's it's good to mention it. So eventually I may uh, motivate someone to to find some, something interesting out of this. So in the massive case, everything was clean. Everything came out only by, from group theory and so on. Here we have to, to essentially eliminate some particles, some uh, generators, because that will give us an extra label for a particles that we haven't seen. So we are using some, say, experimental input, because that's something that we don't see in, in, in four dimensions. Before, the other argument was very clean, just pure mathematics. So. Uh, so it's, it's something for you to think when you when you have free time. Instead of going to the cinema or something, you can. Sorry. Okay, one and K two are the, the generators of the of the of the Lorentz group. Remember that that I define J J I to be I epsilon I J K M J K and K I to be M zero I. Okay. Does this final line uh, mean that in order to get a finite dimensional representation, we have to set W1 uh, to 0 as well? Yes, as exactly. Yes. And then you only consider the, the, the SO2 subgroup of, of this uh, Euclidean group that will be generated by J3. And so that in that case, so the J3 generates just an, 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 uh, uh, just the rotations in, in one dimension. So it's, it's the SO2 group. Rotations in two dimensions, I'm sorry. And that's the SO2 group. Uh, so that's, that's, these are the only ones that we keep. We keep W0 and W3 because this is zero. And they are just um, proportional to, to so that, that, that is given, the only group that we are, is remaining is rotations in two dimensions, which is the original intuitive argument that we were given. It's the rotations in two dimensions that rotate this, uh, uh, the one, the x and y direction, say. That is the, 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 the stability group or the little group. One more question, please. Yeah? Is this the Euclidean group in general? What is that? Is that the Galilean group? No, 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 no. It's a combination of rotations and translations in any 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 dimensions. It's not the same as Galilean. Yes. Okay. Yes. So 
Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, and then I have to finish with this. Uh, so you can see that in this case, uh, then then that this implies that uh, w mu is proportional to p mu because uh, w zero is e and w three is uh, minus e. So probably is e. Sorry, <laughs> has to be any. They have to be equal. And uh, so they are uh, so they are proportional up to J three is uh, W zero is proportional to P zero and W three to P three, and so that means that the constant of proportionality will be the J three and J three for that's for the case where we fix this uh, frame. Sorry about this time. And uh, so we, we fix this frame, it's J3, but in general it will be something that is called a uh, helicity. And that's the only quantum number that is left together with momentum. So that means that the states, that the states for the massless phase uh, will be labeled by zero, which is the eigenvalue of C1, zero, which is the eigenvalue of C2, and then each state will have momentum P mu and helicity lambda. Since these two are zero, it's better to just to define this as just P mu and lambda. And that is uh, the, 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 the way we label a, a, uh, the massless particles. <coughs> If we are within a field theory, to so comments we have uh, from because of CPT invariance, then we have to also include the states with the opposite helicity. And uh, <coughs> that's one thing. The other comment is that the helicity is also restricted. In principle, it's not restricted by any algebraic. Uh, um, Constraint, but it's restricted by a topological constraint in the sense that that uh, since we know that the Lorentz group is not a connected, simply connected group, then the um, the representations can be what is called a projective representations. And uh, so the that means that we have for any state we have to have e to two pi i e to 2 pi i uh, lambda acting on lambda uh, p mu lambda equals to plus or minus p mu lambda. So usually we will have a periodicity here of e to 2 pi i. That will give us the same thing. But since we know that the, the, the Lorentz group, as we say in this first lecture, is, is a double cover, so it's, it's, double, it's, it's doubly connected, it's not simply connected. Uh, so we have to go to e to, the, e to the rotation of 4 pi to get back to the same thing. So e to the 2 pi i p lambda is plus or minus p lambda, and that tells us that lambda is a, is a half an integer. Or it's a better way to write it is zero plus or minus a half plus or minus one. And so on. Okay. So again, this are this defines the the, the massless particles, and the massless particles, for instance, for lambda equal to zero, that is uh, an example of that is what we call the Higgs particle. For lambda equals to one half, we will have the quarks and leptons. For lambda equals to one, we say well, plus or minus one. We will have the <coughs> photons and the W plus minus state and gluons. At the moment, I will skip lambda three hands, 
and then the two is the graviton. Okay. Uh, notice that I'm identifying all the known particles in terms of the massless multiples and not the massive multiples. Okay. We know that the electrons uh, have a mass and that the uh, the W's also have a mass and so on, but I'm putting all of them, all of them, even the Higgs, uh, all of them within the, the massless multiplets. And that's the reason for that, is that all the particles in principle are massless to start with, and then they get a mass by the Higgs mechanism. Okay. So the Higgs mechanism, the thing I mentioned the first day that you are going to see in the standard model course, is the thing that when you break the symmetry, you, you generate masses to the particles. Otherwise, you, you, start, you start treating them as massless. And what the uh, Higgs mechanism will do is to, to complete this into massive multiplets. OK. So that, that's a, a short uh, review of, of the representations of the Poincare and the rotation group. And that is just a preamble to start now the n equals 1 supersymmetry representations. So now let's now let's do the n equals to one. <clears throat> okay, so several observations for this. So first, we have to look for the Casimirs of the supersymmetry algebra, then equals to one supersymmetry algebra. C1, the, the Casimir of, uh, of the Poincare uh, group, which is P mu, P mu, is still a Casimir, right? because, uh, because uh, P mu commutes with the supersymmetry generators and so on, so still this still is a Casimir. For the supersymmetry algebra, this is still a Casimir. So that means that, again, the mass will be a good label for the representations. However, the second Casimir, of the Poincare group that we were using, W mu, W mu, is no longer a Casimir for supersymmetry. Okay. <clears throat> that is as good because uh, that means, remember that Ws at the end, Ws, the, 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 this W mu, W mu, we were identifying that with a spin. And uh, since it is no longer a Casimir, that means that a spin is not a good quantum number now for labeling a multiplet. So that means that within a multiplet, we, you can have particles of different spin. And that's precisely what we were expecting about supersymmetry. Okay. So because this is true, that means that it can have particles of different spin. Within multiples. Okay. Now, C1, I'm sorry, C2 is no longer a Casimir, but we can see if there is something else that can be a Casimir. There's another operator that we can define now that uh, substitutes C2 as a Casimir operator for the supersymmetry algebra. And actually, there is one. And uh, so new Casimir <clears throat> The definition is a bit complicated, but uh, just for completeness, I will give it. Uh, I can call it C2 tilde to differentiate it for C2. And this is uh, equal to C mu nu, C mu nu, and C mu nu 
by itself is defined to be b mu p mu minus b mu p mu, where p is a standard momentum and b the b, b mu's are the w mu the 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 Pauli-Lewanski ve vector minus a combination that depends on the supersymmetry generators. One quarter q bar alpha dot sigma mu alpha dot beta times q beta. Okay. So now we have then we have two Casimirs, C1 and C2 tilde. So this it will, it's a little bit cumbersome. To, to see that it's a Casimir, but it's, it's good to have, uh, to know that there is, and then we will know that there will be a second label. And, uh, and uh, is, this Casimir is usually referred to as a super spin. So the corresponding quantum number will be super spin. Okay. So. <clears throat> Now, the, before we start building the elements of a multiplet in supersymmetry, uh, I will prove for you a general result. So now we know we have a multiplet, and the multiplet will have different particles. The different particles may have different spins, which is good. And so I will prove you a very general result for all the multiplets. Claim in any supersymmetric multiplet. The number of bosons which I call NB equals the number of fermions. Which I will call N. So that means that Mb equals nf within a multiple. So we know in multiple we have several particles, different spins, but the number of particles with the integer spin equals the number of particles with half integer spin. And that's actually a way to identify supersymmetry. You have the same number of bosons and fermions within a multiple. This is the standard statement when people say that for every particle of the standard model, supersymmetry will predict another particle. So that means that the electron is, is, is a multiple by itself for the Poincare group. But for supersymmetry, it has to come <coughs> with a bosonic partner to have the same number of bosons and fermions. And that's why there will be a, a new particle predicted by supersymmetry called the selectron, the partner of the electron, and so on. The same for every, every particle that we know of the standard model. So let me try to prove this claim. <coughs> the first thing uh, to do is to consider a new operator, which is uh, what I call uh, minus 1 to the f. or just for simplicity, minus to the f. And this is called fermion number. Uh, 
This operator, what does it do it, as an operator? It acts on the boson. <coughs> And that will give you the same thing. But when it acts on a fermion, it gives you it's a negative. Here I'm defining B to be boson and F to be fermion. OK, so this is the definition. It's an operator that acting on a fermion changes the sign, and to the boson it doesn't do anything. OK, so we can start with this operator. And uh, <coughs> by its own definition, we can see that minus 1 to the f anti commutes with the uh, supersymmetry generators. Okay. And this is true, we can do it case by case. So I'm, I'm claiming that this is true. Since, for instance, I can start, for instance, at taking minus 1 to the f times q alpha acting on a fermion equals, since q acting on a fermion gives me a boson, then you have minus 1 to the f acting on a boson, and that is equal to the boson. But then when I do minus q alpha minus to the f acting on the fermion. That will give me the same thing, because we know that minus to the f acting on the fermion, that will give me a minus sign. Together with minus sign is a plus. q alpha acting on the fermion. That is, again, the boson. So these two things are equal. And the same for. Similar, when, when it acts on bosons, you, you can verify yourself and, and, uh, and, and realize that, that these two operators act in the same way for fermions and bosons. For action. On B. OK. So we have this. Uh, relation between these two operators. Okay, now consider the following object. We will compute the trace of the following thing. The trace of minus to the f times the anti commutator of q and q bar. So we will do that, and you will see why this will be uh, useful. This is a trace. I'm taking the trace, meaning that I'm solving over all the states within a multiplet. That's what, that is what trace means. So this will be then, I'm just write this explicitly, so it's minus 1 to the f times q alpha q bar beta dot plus minus 1 to the f q 
few bar bitter dot. Comes to alpha. Which equals trace of. Now I take this pair here, minus to the f times q alpha, and use the condition that I proved over there that is minus q times minus 1 to the f. So this is the opposite with the minus sign. So it's minus q alpha q bar beta dot. OK, so I'm using the property I just pro proved over there. And uh, on this side, I use the property of the trace, that the trace is cyclic. So it's the trace of A, B, C is equal to the trace of C, A, B for, for arbitrary operators. So then you have, you can just move here, and then will be Q alpha And uh, voila, now you can do this. And uh, can you tell me what, to, what, what is the value of this? Good. OK. So then that means that we know that the trace of this operator is 0. OK? The trace of this operator is 0. But we also know that this operator, we know what the commutator of this object, the anti-commutator of this object uh, uh, is. Um, yes, I'm finishing in three minutes. So the anti-commutator of this trace of minus 1 to the f q alpha q bar beta dot equals trace of minus 1 to the f. And the anti-commutator of q and q bar, we derived it in the, in the previous, previous lecture, which is uh, there's a 2 that was uh, uh, um, conventional. And then the rest was just sigma mu alpha beta dot times p mu. OK? <clears throat> so within a representation, the sigmas are just numbers. The 2 is, is a number. And p mu, I'm fixing, fixing it. For a fixed p within a representation, I'm considering elements in the representation with the same p, because I'm using that as one of the, 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 the labels of the representation. So that means that this is equal to 2 sigma mu alpha beta dot p mu trace of minus 1 to the f. This is for fixed p. Okay. So in that sense, within a representation, the value of the operator p is the eigenvalue little p, which is fixed. So that means that I, I, I finish already because Because now I know that, that uh, since all the subjects are arbitrary, they're not, so they're arbitrary, so they are not zero. And we prove that that trace is equal to zero over there. So what we have is that, that the trace of the operator minus 1 to the f equal to zero. But what is the trace of minus 1 to the f? Trace of minus 1 to the f equals the sum of all the states within a multiple to, uh, uh, when you apply minus 1 to the f. So that means I have all the bosons, minus 1 to the f boson. This is a trace, sum of all the b's, plus sum of all the fermions. We have fermions minus 1 to the f, fermions. 
Okay, so you take the trace, you sum over all the states, you separate the sum, you first sum over all the bosons, and then form sum over all the fermions. And trace means that this, the bra and the ket are the same. So that, that's what the, the, the trace means. Okay, so but we know that minus one to the f acting on the bosons give us the same thing. That's the definition of minus one to the f acting on the boson that gives us the boson. So this is equal to the sum of the bosons. But minus one to the f acting on fermion gives us minus itself, so that you get a minus here. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry all this was equal to zero. So this was minus and then sum over all the fermions. And that is equal to zero. Okay, but wh what is this? You just you have uh, normalized the states. This is essentially count the number of fermions, the number of bosons, and this counts the number of fermions. It's, it's one per boson, and this gives us one per fermion. So that means this is all. This is equal to n b, and this is equal to n f. So what we are proving at the end is that n b equals nf. Okay, so the number of fermions equals to the number of bosons. Okay, so that, that's, that's, that's the end. So this is a very, very general result. So if you have only using the, the, the supersymmetry algebra, you can prove a very general uh, result that in any multiple you will build, there will always be as many bosons as fermions. So that's a way of seeing that it's supersymmetric. Okay, so we'll continue next time.